This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-711-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. This is Dan and Matt again, and I think we can sum this week up really easily. 3-2-1. Three, Three wins, two suspensions, and one loss. Matt, well, and first overall. And first overall, and we should qualify that. Not first overall in the entire league. First overall in the West. We're not doing that well yet. This isn't a President's Trophy team. Well, give it a few weeks. Um, well, let's jump right in and talk about those three wins. So the Calgary Flames were riding high on a two-game win streak when uh, they played against Columbus. And this is a game you and I weren't quite sure what to expect. And Well, like last week uh, uh, with our show, like I had mentioned that the Flames were going to have to tighten up on defense because teams like Columbus can score a lot on you. And the Flames are like, eh, so what? You scored six goals. What do we well, care? Well, I mean, this is the weird thing, right? When you score nine goals, you better win the game. But when you get six goals scored against you, you don't deserve to win the game. Like most nights, if you get six scored against you, you deserve to lose. So this is a weird game. I know a lot of people are like, wow, so many goals. And, you know, I know the fan base was so proud of this. But I'm like, we have to remember, they we let six goals in on our own goalie. Yeah, it, it was not a game that you would qualify as a defensive battle in any way, shape, or form. And this was, it was only the who eight... can outscore the other quickest. Yeah, I think that was the eighth game since the Flames have been in Calgary that uh, they've had 15 goals scored in the contest. Yikes. So, yeah, it, a bit of an aberration. All right, who can score more than the other? you got 60 minutes. Ready? Go. Yeah, well, it's like that uh, game back in, I think, 2007 or eight against Tampa Bay where Aginla and Huzelius both got hat-tricks in a 9-6 game that year. But uh, oddly enough, Tortorella was the coach for, of that team, too, uh, at the time. But uh, Tortorella yeah, was just... the coach of the Vancouver team that year that we had a line brawl a few years ago, too. So there's a lot of good Calgary moments with Tortorella. Yeah. Um, and weird thing too. I mean, how often do you? There's one that he had though, but you know that's unfortunate. No for. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We'll we'll talk about that in a bit here. I have a a theory on that. But how often do you see four goalies used in a single game? I know it's like uh, next up, uh, random fan in section two sixteen. <laughs> it, it's like one of those intermission games. If your seat is called, please come down, put on the pads, and get into the net. <laughs> Try not to die. <laughs> but that's why they have emergency goalies up in the press box. Um, who needs the sumo at the intermission when they can just stick in the net? But, yeah, I mean, Bobrovsky and Corbusella both played for Columbus, and Riddick and Smith both played for Calgary. And I guess the only good thing here is that both Johnny and Monty had four points each. Yeah, like, it, it, it was nice to see the Flames come back after going down 4-1. But... It was also bad that they went down 4-1. And, like, I couldn't fault Riddick on any of the goals that he gave up in the first period. And, frankly, all of the goals Calgary allowed, the goalies didn't really have that great of an opportunity to save them. It was just a really bad defensive game overall for Calgary. And somehow even worse of a defensive game for Columbus. Yeah, I don't know. This is... Like you said, it was not a great game for either side. Very back and forth. This is a shooting gallery, and I think we're just lucky that we outscored the other team. Yeah. This is one of those games that uh, you just take the game pl tape and you just throw it in the trash and you just kind of like, that happened. Yay, we, we got two points. We can put it next to Pittsburgh game in the garbage can. Yeah, never. and we just move on. That never happened. You know, 
focus on the next game. Well, after that one, the Flames did tighten up on defense, as you said they would need to. Uh, they played against the Wild with Smith and Net. He made 31 saves, and Lindholm scored twice. Technically a hat trick, but two that counted. Um, as the Flames got a 2 nothing win over the Wild. And quite a crazy game here. I was at this one watching from the press box. But um, we we can talk about what happened here, all the suspensions and and all that. But I will say in this one, um, you know, if, if that offside is offside, then the Flames should be the 0-4 champions. True. Like, it's funny how now, what, just over 10 years later, we know how to look at where the line is and where a puck is on that line. Newfangled technology we didn't have in 4 Yeah, I know. It, it happens. Like, I'm glad that, that didn't puck... cost the Flames the game, though. Yeah. Like, frankly, the, that puck might have been a half a centimeter or offside if that but offside is offside that's the rules and it sucks when it happens to you but it you know it it could easily go the other way so not a big deal and the flames won so eh. well that's what i mean i'm glad it didn't cost the team you know any any points. It's not like that was the thing that made us lose this game. We're still able to win handedly. There's still no question in the win here. Yeah, and it was good to see Mike Smith frankly not really even tested much in the, the shutout win. Like uh, Minnesota kind of sucked in this game uh, offensively. I didn't feel like any nervousness when they had the puck much at all. It, it, it was fairly vanilla from them uh you come to expect more from them over the years but that was kind of a pathetic effort from them to me i think minnesota played the way that we expect minnesota to play and you know they played their very defensive game the flames were able to be a little more offensive and win this one i will say about smitty i think this game he looked like the Smitty we've seen in the past, and I think this was probably his best game this year, even though he didn't get tested a whole lot. That and the Nashville game in the beginning of the season, I think, were his two best, and he's starting to look more like Mike Smith, and that's a good thing, and hopefully he can keep that up moving forward and start to reclaim himself as the starting goaltender for the team and hopefully get those numbers back into actual NHL goaltender category instead of what they've been lately. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the fact, I mean, we saw him go behind the net here. He was leaving his net a lot, which is a sign of confidence. We even saw him lay a chick, uh, check on Parise, which was pretty funny to watch. You can tell that he's getting comfortable with his game again. Yep. It's like, all right, somebody blew their check here. I guess I'll pick it up. Yeah, any time that the goaltender is throwing a body check, you know you're having a good night. <laughs> we should probably talk about the suspensions here. So late in the game, um, I guess you could say that crap hit the fan in this one. Um, there was the Giordano. Why don't we start with the Giordano one? So there was the Giordano knee. I don't know what you thought of that. Well, I can see due to the fact that Cam Fowler got hurt a couple of years ago when Giordano clipped him in a similar manner. Like, I don't think either were intentional dirty hits. It's just that it was a knee on knee. I think that Giordano is only just trying to, like, get in his way a little bit to slow him down so he didn't get completely beat. And he caught a little more of him than he expected. That's what it looked like from watching the replay. And it's unfortunate that Koivu got hurt. And it's unfortunate that Giordano got suspended. But it did warrant it but you know frankly if that's a suspension i think that the kunitz elbow to the hammock a couple games ago should have also been a suspension for sure and i think that's the big thing is geo wasn't attempting to injure and i think that's very evident there was no attempt there and yeah okay even though you know maybe someone did get hurt there's no way that you could look at that and say oh yeah he attempted to hurt a guy yeah it was more of a accidental bad thing where like that kunitz hit was uh oh you're skating in my general direction here's an elbow to your face to break your nose like and yet that's okay and kunitz has a track record of being dirty and getting suspended and yet he didn't get anything so the department of player safety is a little bit inconsistent but 
not, not much you can do. Nope. Who runs that now? It's George Paros, right? Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that, uh, if I recall correctly, the team that has the player that's hurt has to complain to that department for them to actually review it. Hmm. So, unless it's blatant where, you know, like, oh, a guy left the bench when he wasn't supposed to and got... You know, like that uh, altercation with Detroit a couple years ago where the guy left the bench and got 10 games automatically. Stuff like that, it's automatic, but yeah. Well, and then we have the hit that I think we can all say probably wasn't in good spirits, especially as late in the game as it was, um, and that's the Dumba hit on Backland. Yep. Uh, dirty as it comes uh, in terms of knowing that your opponent is in a vulnerable position with less than a minute left to go in a game where the game's already out of reach that should have been a suspension as well even though it was a cleanish hit the circumstances of when the hit was it that should have got a game frankly yeah, but it didn't get a penalty so you know it's apparently a-okay in their book which uh, again, consistency from the, you know, like they're wanting headshots out of the game, and yet two Flames players in the last week and a bit have had the headshots, and that's A OK. Yet a guy goes to fight the guy who caused the headshot, gets two, two games, and uh, uh, accidental ish looking play also gets two games. Like, it's like. You know, make up your mind, like, do you want these things out of the game or not? And, you know, there's just no consistency. It looked to me, if you look back at it, like Dumba left his feet. Um, I don't think he did, but, uh, like, when you review it and play it back slower, it looks like he left his feet, but he was back on his feet by the time he made the check. Yeah, it was in that grayish area where... Like, if he had got suspended for a game or two, you'd be like, yeah, okay, that's fair. He didn't, and that, too, is fair, but in context of the other guy getting suspended, Giordano getting suspended, it, it's just, it, it's poor form. Well, and good for Lomberg for following up on that. I mean, that's Lomberg's job on the team, and he knows that, so good for him for going after Dumba. He totally deserved a suspension on that, but, I mean, that's his role, and if... Lomberg's out of lineup, we're not going to miss him that much. Yeah, and frankly, the Flames re-sign Lomberg at the end of the year, and the part that he misses it, in terms of being suspended, that's your signing bonus. Two games? Yeah, yeah. whatever funds he misses from that. Yeah, you could do that. Just add it to the signing bonus. I don't know, there's probably a way to get around that, too. I mean, you have him do you know, one more autograph sign in a car dealership and make the fee for that exactly what he lost. Or, you know, there's lots of ways to get around that. Yeah. Um, we talked to the coach afterwards, and if you listen to the coach in his post-game comments, he said none of that should have happened because the game should have been really over at, I believe it was, what, 321 when Backlund got tripped on the open net, and he said that the rules say that if you get tripped on the open net, it's an automatic goal. So... Lots of animosity on both sides. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the next game against these guys. Yeah, and they come up next week, so later this week, actually. So that will be a interesting game. And I'm sure that the Flames might dress a couple of enforcer types. And I think a certain player might have a target on his back. You wonder I if, don't know. You wonder if they sit Dumba. I, if I was them, I would. Because I think there's going to be quite a few pissed off Flames players so that are going to want his head. So keep two enforcers on the ice and one up in the press box. Even if Dumba's up there, you can grab his his uh, suit jacket and pull it over his head. Yep. <laughs> we need guys watching all over the rink. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Dumba sighting. You're not, you're not getting away from us. That's right. <laughs> Someone will stand out by the bus for when he comes out afterwards. Yep. <laughs> Um, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting, but you know, you need those games that have that passion. And I think that's one of the, one of the interesting things there is there, there's now a storyline and a team that we usually don't care about, especially, you know, a game this, at this point in the season against what will be Minnesota at 1130 AM, usually no one would care, but now there's that built in storyline, which is going to be really cool. Yeah. And 
it'll be interesting to see. And I think after Gaudreau got hurt by a stall last year, now Backlund gets hurt. I think that the intensity of the games against Minnesota is going to turn up, and I think that it's going to be a lot more chippy from now on until their identity changes a bit, where they're not, you know, targeting players. So, yeah, it is what it is. Interesting note on Lindholm after this one is he scored his uh, 14th and 15th of the season. His career high is 16 in a season, or sorry, 17 in a season. Uh, in 1415 and and uh, 45 points is as high right now he's got 16 flames goals and 34 points so here's a guy who's gonna blow away his career highs well it's nice when you come to a new situation and you fit in with a certain line like a glove and you know when the flames like when he was wanting to be traded from Carolina he did not want to be a right winger anymore he wanted to be a center. But then the Flames acquired him, and Bill Peters was the coach, and, you know, he's like, oh, well, you know, I guess I'm going to be a right winger again, and got told that, oh, well, we'll play you with Monaghan and Gaudreau, and I think he's like, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, they I, they yeah. have tried him at center, and I would say that yeah. he's had enough, you know, he still takes a lot of face-offs and stuff. Yeah, but, you know... It, it, and I can understand that because he likes playing a certain way, but, you know, when you're playing on a line with two of the best players in the NHL, it kind of makes your job a lot easier. And, you know, it, it's certainly counting, they're raking up the W's, so it seems to be working. And I could see him getting slipped swap down to the second line as the second line center if we needed to but yeah i don't want to break up that first line of a game yeah right now. yeah for right now it's fine when you've got a line like that you don't want to break it up um which brings us to some shuffling in the lines as calgary played nashville out three guys they didn't have lomberg they didn't have the captain because he was serving a suspension and they didn't have backland because he was hurt so yeah, in addition to missing for Leak Stone and Valamaki as well, so who are already out. Yeah, so, so uh, quite a depleted lineup. I always picture making a call from the farm like the bat signal, where you like flash the the flaming sea in Stockton, and the players like what? They need me, and off to Calgary they go. But uh, they made two call ups here. Well, not really two call ups. Oliver Shillington was already here. He was in the lineup, and they called up Alan Quine, um, who also got to play here. Yeah, they also uh, called up Renat Valiev just to be uh, in case anybody gets hurt on game day and we don't have time to fly somebody in type thing. And here's a couple of bucks because you're here. And he's already been reassigned back down. Yeah, I wasn't even going to mention that because he came and left without us seeing him at all. Um, yeah. But in this one, the the Flames had the Flames won five to two over the Predators. Really, some interesting storylines here. Oliver Shillington gets his first goal, his first assist, and his first multi point game, all in one. The kids. Well, living... if you're gonna do it, you might as well do it right. And uh, you know, but didn't I mean didn't Shillington look so much different after scoring that goal in this one? He almost got one or two more. Yeah, no, it's all about confidence and like he deked out three predators at one point and got an excellent scoring chance almost got his second goal in the first period and he when he's on offensively he can be a top pairing level offensive defenseman it's just that he still makes some really bad decisions defensively not as many, and he's getting better, but it's still a work in progress. But there's flashes of upper-tier potential with him. It's just, can he get that consistency on the defensive side? Otherwise, you're looking at somebody who might be a more flashy version of a Marc-Andre Bergeron who's just dynamite for the power play, and then you just kind of shelter him beyond that. We've talked a little bit about Shillington before, but... Um, he's got seven games and I think he's already looking better than Valimaki did in some areas. He looks more polished, I think, than Valimaki. I think when Yuso is ready, if it was me, I would send Yuso down to the farm for a bit, sort of like we did with Dubé, and leave Shillington here. Yeah, I could see that. And that wouldn't be the worst idea. And you could easily swap them at any point because they're both waiver exempt. So, 
just, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like a big deal. So just, they're both playing well and let Velimaki get some steam back up in the AHL. And if, if Shillington continues to play well, if he struggles a bit, then never mind. <laughs> And then the other interesting story here, we got a goal as first as a flame and his first of the year from the new call-up, Alan Quine, saying, hey, I want to stay here. I'm going to score some goals. And uh, go. That was an all right goal, you know, it, not highlight worthy at all or anything. But, you know, isn't it, I mean, it shows something about this player that he can come in and score that kind of goal in his first game. Oh, for sure. And I think... Because, like, I remember watching him back when he was with Detroit a little bit and when he was with the Islanders, and there was always flashes of skill with him. It's just, like, a lot of players, there was no consistency at the NHL level. And since the Flames signed him, he's been the offensive juggernaut for Stockton. And he's still young enough, he's only 26, and sometimes players do take a while to figure things out. Like, Kenny Augustino has, I think, 15 points with Montreal now, at, on his, like, fourth team now, and it takes a while sometimes, and Quine obviously has some hands if he could do what he did. So, it whether he can perform at a consistent level or not yet is yet to be seen but hey it's another option showing that hey he can play at the nhl level if need be quine's got 86 nhl games to his name so far uh seven goals 16 assists for 23 total points i think after watching quine here and i've gone back and taken a little bit of a look at uh some of his stockton footage I think if it wasn't for the China trip, where I don't think these guys necessarily had as much of a chance to evaluate all their players they wanted to, if they were a little more familiar with them, I wouldn't be surprised if he made the team out of camp. Yeah. I think uh, him and, and Zarnik he, might have been flipped. Yeah, and he's a versatile enough player. I think he can play on left wing as well. That he, he could potentially take a spot and i think that it's entirely feasible that he remains and a guy like say manjapane or any of the miscellaneous fighters go but goes back to stockton instead yeah it could be and then we also got a goal in this game from the flames newest sniper his fourth of the year from your boy garnet hathaway yeah he's all right which, interesting stat now, after 31 games, Garnet Hathaway has more goals than James Neal. I don't know if we should be so, happy with so, Hathaway's production or upset with Neal's production. Well, you know, everybody who plays bets on that, you know, can come collect their winnings and we'll be waiting forever there. And, yeah, um, Hathaway's a good player when he's able to do his own thing and... He did his own thing on that one, and it ended up, I do believe, being the game-winning goal. So it's all good, and uh, Neil, he'll figure it out. It's not like he's not getting chances. He's just, his shooting percentage is ridiculously low, and that always bounces back. It's not like he's being completely vacant on the ice and invisible. It, he is getting good chances. They're just not going in for him. Hathaway's starting to remind me a lot of Lance Boma. You remember Boma had one year we really put up good offensive numbers. I think Hathaway is being relied on still to be the physical guy, but he's showing that when needed, he can do a little bit of the offense as well. Yeah, and he was always a very smart player. Like Even before we signed him, when we watched him at the development camp, like he stood out to me as somebody who understood what he had to do in order to be successful and went out and did those things, and, like, even from the first viewing, I thought the Flames should have offered him a contract, and then they followed up and did so, and he, even in Stockton, like, he's not the most talented player, but he always knows where he has to go in order to be effective, and you can't teach that. It, it's just an intrinsic sense that he has, and he's capitalizing both at, in Stockton and now at the NHL level, and if he can, say, even chip in 8, 9, 10 goals in a season, awesome. You know, for what of a type of a player and what role he is playing, that's 
amazing for what we need him to be. Yeah, and I think you said it right. He knows his role, right? I mean, there's a guy who knows what his job is, knows how to go out and do that job well. Um, a guy that he sort of reminds me of in that respect is a guy like David Moss, who I think stuck around the league for longer than he should have because he knew what his role was, and he did that thing very well. Yeah, and some players know that they're go- relied on to be the goal scorer, and he's relied on to be the agitator, mucker type to get the other team off their game and you know be a physical presence in the offensive zone and capitalize when he can. Well, after that game, the Flames were riding high on a five-game win streak, and then they decided to take a quick road trip up to Edmonton and ended the streak uh, with a one-nothing loss to the to the Oilers, putting Riddick back in net for this one. Interesting note that with their one-nothing loss to the Oilers, the Flames have now dropped five straight games in Rogers' place, and this is only the second time this season they've been shut out. The other time was a two-nothing loss to Vegas back on November twenty-third. So I thought here, Calgary played an okay game. You could tell they were on the back end of a back-to-back, but I think Edmonton dictated the style and the pace of the game here, and Calgary wasn't able to do their thing. They were kind of trying to keep up to Edmonton. That was my thoughts on this one. Yeah, you could tell the Flames were playing the third game in four nights or the fourth game in six nights. Like They were burnt, and Edmonton was fresh, I think they only had one game in their past three three days heading into this one. So, of course, you have a fresh team versus a tired team. The fresh team's going to be a little bit more peppy. And, frankly, I'm actually surprised by how bad the Oilers were in this game. Considering all of those factors, they only scored one goal and only had a few scoring chances. Like... This was a team that, they're full on. It, everybody's healthy. The Flames are missing half of their lineup, practically. And dead tired. Well, I think, I think that's a good thing to mention here, too. I thought the Flames played well, considering they're missing two of their best players and probably their best two-way centerman, who would normally be tar- who would normally be on the ice against McDavid. Well, you also have to add for Leak there. You know, he's probably the sa- Flames' best defensive winger. So you're missing two of your best defensive forwards who would normally be stapled to McDavid all night, plus your Norris-caliber defenseman, and all you can manage is one goal? Like, frankly, that was a performance where once teams figure out how to get around Hitchcock's trap system, the Oilers are going to fall hard, because they should have easily won that game 4-5-1, or five to one, maybe. Uh, or zero, like uh, that should have been a blowout for the Oilers. All the conditions were right, and they only managed a single goal. So, you know, if I was the Oilers, I wouldn't be exactly ha- uh, like an Oilers fan. I'm not a glutton for punishment, as you can tell. Um, that I'd be, frankly, worried about that result, even though they got the two points, because that's not a good team. You know, it's interesting listening to, and I don't usually listen to it, but I had uh, overtime with Pat Steinberg on last night. And just hearing some of the Flames fans who sound like the sky is falling because we lost that game. As you said, all the conditions were there for Calgary to lose, and they did a really good job, all things considered. Um, Yeah, like if that one goal would have counted that they called back, or if one of the couple of posts that they hit had gone in, then that... You know, it's an overtime game, and who knows what happens. So, you know, a good bounce here or there, and the Flames could have won that game. And they didn't get it, unfortunately. But, you know, like, okay, yeah, you don't like to lose to Edmonton because, you know, who wants to lose to Edmonton? But but this isn't like some past years where we've been blown out by the Oilers. Yeah, uh, and frankly, this week, we played three elite teams, and a team that should be a lottery, a high lottery team. And we beat all three of the good teams. Mm -hmm. So, okay, yeah, we dropped the the last game where the Flames are burnt and have a good portion of their good players out. 
And to a hot Edmonton team. I yeah. mean, Hitchcock has finally managed to get some wins out of this group. Yeah, and they only gave up one goal. Like, come on. Like, that, you, you know, it, you, if you're going to complain about that, like, come on. Well, and, and we see this every time the Flames go on a win streak, right? I mean, we go on the six or seven games in the past, and we lose, and it's like, the sky's falling. Nobody has won 82. No, no you're going to lose done it. at least 30 to 40% of your games. So we lost one to Edmonton. To me, the question is, you know, it's not, oh, we lost Edmonton, woe was us. No, if we lose to Philly, and we lose to Minnesota, and we lose to St. Louis, now we got a problem. But you're going to lose a game. So we lost one. We get two days off. Let's go back. Let's kick Philly's butt, take another two days off, and get back on the horse. Yeah, exactly. And frankly, all three of the teams that the Flames play this week are not very good. And they should, if they continue to play well, should get six points. So the the sky's not falling. Like The f- conditions were just favorable that day for the Edmonton Oilers to win. And, and if we would have played with a full roster, I think it would have gone the opposite way. Yeah, like, honestly, if Giordano is in the game, just him, the Flames win that game. Because that goal against doesn't happen. So it, It's true. You know, it, so, yeah, we lost, but if you're going to complain about that, like, stop being a hockey fan. Like, come on. It, <sighs> The Flames are the first place team in the Western Conference. And they were dead tired, missing a bunch of players. And they lost by a single goal to a team that's red hot. Come on. Those are the kind of lo- losses I can stomach. Yeah, exactly. It's when you lose like the Pittsburgh game where it, like everything goes wrong. Those are a problem. You know, yeah. it, 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 you lose one nothing. I think it stings because eh. it was Edmonton. Yeah. Oh, I know. Like, if it was Arizona, say, instead of Edmonton, everybody would be like, eh, okay, who cares? On to the next well, one. Well, yeah, I mean, if it was Anaheim, San Jose, Dallas, you know, we, Colorado, Winnipeg, Nashville, we wouldn't be having that same conversation. Yeah. And speaking of the Ducks, you know how many horseshoes they have? Like, last night, they they won 6-5. to five. But they won only because New Jersey scored three goals on their own net. Like, can they get any luckier? Like, come on. <laughs> was Steve Smith there? Oh. The worst one was Andy Green. He he literally batted the puck. It would have been a high stick had it been a Ducks player. But he literally reached up to knock it into his own net. And it's like, wow, dude, come on. And it was with like five minutes left to go to give the Ducks the lead. It's like. What are you doing? <laughs> so there's our 3-2-1 of the week, our three wins, um, our two suspensions, and our one loss. And as of right now, as Matt mentioned, the Calgary Flames are 40 points, which puts them first in the Pacific, first in the West, and third in the NHL. I can't remember the last time we've been talking about this team when it's not like the first game of the season and we won our only game that we're like, yeah, we're first in the West. Well, you have to go all the way back to 1993. So December '93 for that uh, for us Back to be this. Then they used to use aluminum sticks. I think that was even before aluminum sticks. Aluminum sticks didn't really come into the, into play until like '95, '96. Okay, so, well there you go. Before aluminum sticks, back when they used wood. Yeah. You'd have to cut down a tree to make your hockey stick. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's nice to see, and I think you know as we've talked about, and we're starting to see it now, the injury bug starting to catch up with this team so the more you can bank points early the better off they're gonna be yeah and that's why like i've always been railing on the fact that like the flames can't like just give october away type of thing because you have streaks like this where oh a third of your players are out of the lineup and you know you're still playing good teams so uh yeah try and win so, well, and historically, you and I have been recording this time, late November, early December, going, wow, these guys are starting to win some hockey games. Like, you know, the summer rust is finally off of them. And this year it's like, okay, we came to play when the season started. Isn't that amazing? I know. And especially because in the first month of the season, like 10 of the 13 games were against playoff teams as of a couple days ago. So, you know, like it's good to see that like despite playing mostly playoff teams to start the year where where we're at and it's good because 
frankly, the rest of our schedule, we don't play that many games against playoff teams. It's like with Jerome leaving. They finally got rid of whatever his curse was. They said, don't start playing hockey till Christmas time. Yep. So, yeah, it's nice to see, and uh, we'll we'll ride as long as we can. We don't have a big lead. We're, I think, one point up on Nashville and uh, Colorado. Yeah. Nashville and Colorado, so hopefully we can stay ahead of that. But we also have one, one game more played than them. So we'll see how things go. But I think it's, you know, pretty good chance Calgary's going to be probably in the top two or three in the West till Christmas. Yep. Um, and looking at that week, and we talked about some injuries and suspensions, so... Giordano's suspension has now been served. He served it in Nashville and Edmonton. Lomberg's has not. So in order to make room, the Flames had to do some interesting roster maneuvering. They called up um, they they called up Peluso for the Edmonton game, which means they'd send Lomberg down to the AHL, and you can't serve a uh, suspension if you're not in the NHL. So Lomberg's now been recalled. Peluso's been sent back down, and Lomberg will sit out against Philly to serve his suspension. That's very confusing. Yeah. So essentially, Lomberg has one more game to sit out, which, I mean, we're not going to miss him, especially not against Philly. No, and Philly's not the Philly of old where you, they were actually somewhat intimidating. Um, the teams... Instead of the Bruised Brothers, they are... Or instead of the Bruised Brothers, they are now the Bruised Brothers. Yeah, and their goaltending is... Yeah... They can't. Win. They still got Elliot, don't they? Yeah, they're waiting for All right, Carter. We can stop talking about it there, then. Yeah, they're waiting for Carter Hart to get to the NHL and hope that he's all that he looks like he'll be. It's just, yeah, uh, you have to go all the way back to Ron Hextall when the Flyers had a, a actual good goalie in his prime and. Like, frankly, the Flyers just need to keep spamming goaltenders until they get a good one, and hopefully Hart works out for them because, well, we've seen with the past number of years since Kipper left that how annoying it is when you have mediocre goaltending, so... I mean, they've got some good pieces there. Oh, yeah. Uh, they're not you a bad know, like, team. I've always been a huge fan of Simmons. I think... Uh, they got Van Riemsdyk now. Claude Giroux, I think, is one of the best centers in the league. Yeah. Like, if they decide to blow this up, they've got a lot of assets they can move. Yeah, and frankly, what if it was me, what I'd be doing is looking at, like, anybody older than Couturier, move them on out. Like, keep Van Riemsdyk because you just signed him, but, you know, move all those pieces out, get a whole bunch of good young pieces in, and, you know, start to rebuild properly. Like, they got Nolan Patrick, they got... Couturier, they got Goss to spare. When we were originally talking about a right winger for the first line, I was of the opinion that if they could swing it and make the deal work, they should have gone out and got Simmons. Yeah, and I think that if the Hurricanes deal hadn't happened, I think that Goss to spare and Simmons would have been Flames. But, you know, it did, So and it's working, so there's no, no real problem there. So after this week, I guess we now have a four to go with our 3-2-1. The Flames have four guys on the injury reserve. Michael Froelich, we know, went on the reserve on the 20th with a lower body injury. Uh, still on IR. Michael Stone uh, on the 21st with a blood clot still on the IR. Uh, three days later, Yusuf Valimaki went on the IR with a lower body injury. And now Backlund on December 6th with concussion. And it looks like all those guys are going to be out for a while. I don't see them rushing anybody back in this lineup. So kind of a depleted Flames lineup here, which is going to leave some opportunity for Mangiapane, for... Um, Jankowski. Quine. Yeah, all whole Jankowski. bunch. You know, Neil. Yeah. Like, and so, the thing is, is that like with all of those injuries, you don't need to really rush anybody back. It's not like the Flames are struggling. Even if they drop a few in the next week or two, it's like, eh, we've built up a like eight point lead, nine point lead on the playoff spot. So it's like, you know, you can handle losing a couple and make sure that guys are healthy instead of rushing everybody back and them getting hurt again. A few of us were sitting in the media lounge after the after the wild game. And we're sitting there saying, okay, if, you know, let's assume that certain guys are going to be out or suspended and playing, you know, shuffle with the lines. And it's nice that you have, like, we sat there and we probably had six or seven different possibilities that we came up with. And when was the last time this team was deep enough you could do that? And the pastor would have been like, well, 
we could take uh, you know our Garnet Hathaway and stick him on yeah. the second or line. Or and- harkening back to 04, where the farm team consisted of Jason Morgan and Jason Morgan. You know, you got an injury, you, you here for- you, you go. You forgot Camilleri. Yeah. You know, so it's nice that, I mean, even if you look at the lines as they were last game, we've still got the Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm as line one. Kachuk, Bennett, Jankowski, line two, should be a good line. Maggiapani, Ryan, and Neal on third. And then Zarnik, Quine, and Hathaway. Like, this is still a strong lineup, and I think that's one of the things the Flames have going for them this year is depth. I mean, yeah, it's not a second line you'd want to run with all year. No. But we have enough depth to fill holes, and that's been a lot of our problem in the past. Yeah, and I think that uh, if it was me for the next game, I'd swap uh, Bennett down to the third line and bring Neil up with Jankowski and Kachuk just to try and get Neil going a little bit. And Bennett's looked okay, but that line hasn't really been clicking much lately, and I think that trying something new there might help. I think Bennett's looked good on that line. I think he's sort of like Backlund. He's realizing maybe he doesn't need to be the pure sniper on this team, and he has a different role. Um, I mean, that took us as Flames fans a few years to realize with Backlund that, hey, he's number one pick, or a first-round pick, but that doesn't mean he needs to be you know, our top sniper guy, and I think we might be seeing that with Bennett, but since the lines are shuffled anyways, yeah, I agree with you. Or, instead of even dropping Neil, I would actually go Kachuk, Bennett in the middle, and Neil on the on the right. Yeah, that could work, too. I think Kachuk and Bennett have better chemistry than Kachuk and Janko. Yeah, I can agree with that, too. And then you can drop uh, Mangiapane down, so it's Mangiapane, Ryan, Jankowski. Yeah. And, uh, like, it, I wouldn't even be opposed if Quine got a shot on that second line, because he looked decent as well. Just a look here or there, just to see if... You might as well. Yeah, I don't know if I'd go that high with Quine yet. Yeah. I think you've got guys like Neil who probably need to get going before Quine. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's talk about what's probably the best story of the week, is that Smitty continues to look good. It looks like Smitty's back. He's looking like an NHL goaltender again. Um, we talked a little bit about this last week, but... Based on what you've seen this week, he got a couple starts. Are you convinced that uh, Smith is ready to go for the rest of the year? Uh, not yet. It, it's encouraging that he's had a few good games this week, and he's only really had two difficult games, and that would be the Columbus and Nashville game. And, like, the Minnesota game... Minnesota didn't really generate much in the line of offensive chances, so it's one of those things where I'd still be waiting and seeing, and, like, Riddick played extremely well against the Oilers, so he's playing well still, so it's not really that big of a deal if you have Smith play a little less. Like, I'm expecting that um, Smith will get the Philly game and then one of the two Minnesota... Uh, St. Louis games. and We need some checkers in the lineup for Minnesota. Maybe we should put Smitty in. Yeah. Go target so, Parise yeah, again. That's right. Or wait for Dumba to come behind your net and just smoke him. Yeah. Um, but anyway, if you take a look, the Flames are 31 games in. Smitty's played 19 games, which means that Riddick's had 12. We have 51 games left, which is pretty much what you want your starter of that age to play. They're obviously not going to play Smitty for 51 more. But I think that the fact that, you know, they've got a 19-12 split right now, you can really, I think, I wouldn't say that he's ready to play 50 games, but I think he's back in the sense that you could split the workload from here on in, and I think he's going to look okay. Yeah, like if you did a 30-20 split where Riddick gets 20 and Smith gets 30, then you're looking at like a 50-32 in terms of appearances for the season. That's about right. And not really much to complain about. And I think that would be fairly decent for both goalies. And, you know, you don't want... That's the thing with goaltenders. Like, only a couple in NHL history could actually play 70 games and be okay in the playoffs. Most of them weren't Smith's age either. No. And it was just pretty much Martin Brodeur. That could play that well. Cujo could do that in his prime, too. Yeah. There was a couple... could do that in his prime... Yeah, there's a couple, but more the exception than the rule. And 
like we saw with Talbot a couple years ago, he played really well for the 70-some-odd games that he played. Played decently in the playoffs, and now, like, a year and a half later, is looking like not really an NHL goaltender on most nights. And, yeah. you know, it's one of those situations where the Flames are in a good spot because of the fact that Riddick's playing so well that you can kind of swap whichever, depending on whatever game, and just throw random goalies at the opposition and... Yeah. Well, like you were saying about playoffs, that gives you a lot of options when it comes to playoffs too. I mean, you could essentially go every other and really keep the the team off their off their game. Yeah. Well, if if in the playoffs both guys are fresh and ready and are playing at a decent clip, then if say Smith plays poorly in game one, then you can see if Riddick, you know, give Riddick the net for game two and. If he goes on a tear, you let him go. It's just like what the Penguins did when they won their two cups. They had Fleury start the the playoff run. He played well enough for a bit and then struggled a bit, and they put Murray in, and he took him the rest of the way. And the Flames could easily do that if both guys are playing well, that you could just swap depending on how each of them is going. And and facing some adversity for both our goalies in that 9-6 loss. I think it was good to see that Smitty came back for the next two and still looked solid. Riddick, I think, looked solid in the Edmonton game. So that's the big test there of a goalie, too, is not just does he look solid, but what does he do after a loss? Yeah, and you look at the Columbus game. Like Riddick gave up three goals in the first period, but I can't really fault him for any of them because the Flames were... A, a bit of a tire fire for the, that first, like, 22 minutes. So, yeah. But they figured it out, so it's all good. But it's, I, I mean, we've had years where we've come in thinking we should have two good goalies. The team's given us that before. And then one of them or both of them kind of... Um, Mediocre you know, to bad. At, don't live worse. up to things. And yeah. this year, I mean, you and I are both questioning if Riddick should be the backup at the beginning of the season. So. Yeah. Good for him for fighting his way up there and really showing us that, yeah, we've got two guys who can do this. Yeah, and as we go through to the end of the month, like uh, I think the Flames need a verdict on whether or not to go get a goalie by the end of the month. And like if guy, both of them are playing well, then that it's not really a problem. And if one of them really, like the wheels fall off, then you do, and... Yeah, I don't. I don't see the wheels falling off either of these guys now that Smitty seems to be coming back. I agree, and Smith's been known in the past to have stretches where like he just goes into an abysmal streak where like everything goes in. I think every starter gets that. Yeah, and Coyotes fans were warning Flames fans of that when the trade happened that sometimes he'll just disappear for a bit, and there, you know, if you don't have anything else, you're screwed. And that's why you need a backup goalie, right? Yeah, exactly. And allow him to work with the goalie coach for a while. And credit to Jordan Sigalette, who's been much maligned, I think, rather unfairly. I've even talked in the past about how it seemed like every goalie that we brought in you know, didn't do well, and I started to wonder if it was Sigalette. Yeah, but credit to him for working with Smitty and getting him back on his game. And well, you also have to with Riddick, too. Yeah, and Riddick you to also have to look at the fact that what... Uh, Sigalette was given to work with, like, Kari Ramo, he, he was okay as a backup, and he was the best thing that we had, so he was the starter. Hiller, subsequently, as soon as he left here, was out of the league. Ordeo, as soon as he left, was out of the league. I thought Hiller had potential for the Flames when he came here. Yeah. Uh, he was coming off of that uh, vertigo problem, though, so... Once players figured out that, oh, he can't see anything from the blue line, then all the shots came from the blue line, and he was terrible. Um, and then you look at, like, Elliot Johnson. Johnson's on waivers now, and Elliot's tanked the Flyers season. So, you know, as much as you'd like to say, oh, well, it's the goalie coach's fault. We really haven't had a goalie that's been good since Kipper. No, and it... It's unfortunate, but hopefully Riddick can be that guy moving forward, and if not, the Flames will have to spend assets moving forward to get that guy, whomever it is. And no matter how good Smitty's looking this year, I still don't think you bring him back next year. No. 
I think it, it it depends. Like if he finishes off the year strong and he wants to come back on a one year deal, and he's going to be the backup where Smith is get or Riddick's getting fifty games and Smitty's getting thirty, then sure. But I think that there are other places for him. I think you just got to find either way. I think you got to find a different goalie, potentially younger goalie, to be that backup. I don't think there's any point in bringing back. You know, such an old Mike Smith. If if he gets hurt or something at that age, you got nothing else. So I think you know, if you want to maybe sign him as an AHL guy, sure. I don't think he wants that, but I don't see many scenarios where Smitty comes back. No. And I think the Flames are just gonna need to spend some asset of some sort to get a legitimate. I'll be looking, actually I'll look uh, for our next show to see around the league which teams have multiple good young goaltenders to see if there are any actual trade targets. Yeah, I don't know. I think this year we can get by with who we've got. I'm, I wouldn't go out and make a trade right now. But I think that, and even looking at the free agent results, I mean, we've talked about this before. I think there's enough goalies out there that Calgary could make a signing um, you know, in, in the off season. Yeah. I don't think you're going to go after the big goalies like Bobrovsky or Varlamov, but I think there's enough sort of mid-level goalies, um, that the Flames might go out and find their one B or their backup that way. Yeah. So I, I just don't, I think right now with the assets we have, I'd rather not spend them on goaltending. I think there's, I think we need all of our depth right now. But we'll see what happens as we uh, as we move forward. And if, like you said, if one of the goalies really looks bad, we need to make that move before the deadline because the price are going to get too high. I think you've got to make that move in January. Yeah. I don't want to pay deadline prices for anybody this year. I want to sell some of our assets to deadline prices, but I don't want to pay deadline prices yeah. for any acquisition. Well, the only thing that I could frankly see the Flames targeting is a playmaking left winger. And not, like, a top-tier guy, but, like, just a decent, like, second, third line option, just so that way you can have somebody feed Neil some pucks. But that's about it. Like, and, like, frankly, those type well, of guys... If you want, if you want a left-winger for your second line, that's good Chuck. Just put Neil with him. Yeah, I know, but if you want three lines to be awesome, then you could go that route. And uh, the type of guy I'm talking about, you wouldn't spend more than, like, a fourth, third or fourth-round pick on... And that's if there's someone like that available. So didn't we pick up a bunch of those guys last year, like Shore and who else came at the deadline? Chris last Stewart, year? Stewart. Like we we got a bunch of those kind of. Someone said to me in the off season, those guys that just clog up the drain. Um, the Flames got those guys, and it didn't work for them. So I'm not sure they would go down that road again. I think they've got enough guys like Quine and Grayovac that if they're looking for a depth forward, they've got them. Yeah. Well, I could see that, like, if they are wanting, like, three scoring lines to go that route. And it wouldn't be an expensive acquisition. I think, like, that you're looking at more like what, when the, the Flames traded Hoodler or the Oilers traded Hemsky. Like, I think in each case they got a third and a fifth for them. And, like, not an overly expensive acquisition. and I, I also a, don't want to spend draft picks for a no, depth guy I know. this year. And that's where you could toss a prospect in of some sort. Not Maybe. a not a good one, but, you know, just somebody. Do we have many somebodies left? A couple. Josh Healy? Oh, even like a guy like Manjapani, possibly. It, you know, it, it would depend on what you're getting. Yeah, we'll talk about that more when we get close to the deadline, but I'm not sure I want to spend assets at this point, especially future assets, to get a, a third-line guy. I'm not sure it's worth it. Yeah. Well, Matt, we have a couple fan questions we always ask on Twitter and Facebook before we record if the fans want us to talk about anything, and we got two questions this week. Uh, well, one question and one statement, I guess. A uh, friend of the show, Kevin Olenek, he's been on our show a few times, at Kev Ole on Twitter asked us, is it realistic to see the Flames in first place in the West at the end of the season? I'll start with this one, and then I'll feed to you. I don't think so. I think there's stronger teams in the West. Um, I think the Flames will be maybe number one in the Pacific, 
but I don't think that they're going to be number one in the West come the end of the season. I think that they'll be third or fourth. What about you? Uh, I would actually, looking at the schedule, uh, the Flames have played 19 of their first 31 games against playoff teams. And in the remaining 50 games, they only play 23 against playoff teams. So if the Flames can mop the floor with the weaker teams and like frankly they have for most of the season i think they're eight and four against the inferior teams we've even been doing well against teams like nashville who are yeah you know, a good team so you know like if the the flames are even like just over 500 against the playoff teams and are mopping the floor with the bottom feeders <laughs> then just do the fact that we're in a mediocre division that we have more of a chance of getting points than a team like Nashville or Colorado just due to the fact that most of the teams in that division are actually good. So, you know, and even in the East, like, there's not... Like, you you look at the one division where they there's Tampa, uh, Toronto, and Boston, and then, like, there's a few other decent teams in that one, and it's So hard. you're trying to insinuate the Flames could be number one in the NHL? It... it it could happen. I'm not saying it will happen, but due to the fact that the Flames have had probably the hardest schedule and the most travel of any team in the league, and now the rest of our schedule is fairly easy the rest of the way, it could happen. And it, you look at teams that are not very deep. If you're going up against a deep team like Calgary... You you will just out talent them even if your players aren't having necessarily good nights. Like look at the LA and Chicago games from last week. The Flames didn't really play well in either game and still came away with four points. And the Flames could easily keep that up the rest of the way and just beat teams just because they have more guys that are good and. We've won two presence trophies in uh, 1987, 88, and 88, 89. It's been a long time since we've hosted that banner, and I'm not sure this is our year. I mean, could it happen? Yes. I think that you're going to see, though, Tampa Bay, they've got a nine point lead on us right now. Toronto's got a one point lead on us. I think it's going to be tough to beat those teams down the stretch. They're oh, I built agree. For the playoffs. Oh, yeah. I agree. And I actually wouldn't agree with you with built for the playoffs. I actually do not think either one of them will represent the East in the in the Stanley Cup final, but um I I'm actually kind of penciling Boston versus Washington in the conference finals for them, but Interesting. Um good teams that in terms of offense that have kind of weakish defense tend to lose to teams with good defense in the playoffs. Yeah, I think Tampa's got the best goalie of all those teams, though, and so that alone can have you ride it out. Yeah. It, it'll be put it this way. It, to me, it's but either going to be Tampa or Boston representing that division in the conference finals. So you think that, and I mean, yes, it can happen. Lots can happen. But realistically, do you, are you saying you think Calgary's going to be number one in the West come the conclusion of our 82-game season? Yes. Wow. Yeah. And that, You're also the guy who thought we'd win the cup last year. No, I didn't. I thought, well, thought I thought we'd win the division last that's year. That's true. You thought we'd go deep in the playoffs. You yeah. thought we could be well, the Western Conference champions. Yeah, well, I basically thought that the Flames could have been where Vegas was because I saw that the teams in our division were kind of terrible, and if you got through the first round, like you were pretty much good to go because at least to the conference finals, and... I think that's the same this year, and you know, because of our how the playoffs are set up, we're going to be playing two frankly lousy teams if we get through the first round. So it's possible that the Flames get to the conference finals just due to the fact that hey, we have a complete NHL team versus other teams that don't. I think our team has the biggest question, as we talked about, is can our goalies last? And I think one reason I don't see Calgary as number one is I think Nashville has better goaltending in Rene and Saros than we do overall. I think that's going to keep them number one in the in the West. And uh, That very well could be. It's just that they have a little bit more of a difficult 
path just due to their division being better. But again, yeah. it splitting hairs. I think that either I think the Flames are going to win the division going away. Oh, I think they win the Pacific for sure. I think it's going to be a struggle to win the West. Yeah. And I think you'll be seeing Colorado, Calgary, and Nashville swapping spots pretty much every week for the foreseeable future. I don't think that you'll see any true separation until probably February, March. Yeah, I can go with that. I think you're right. It'll be Nashville, Colorado, Calgary, pretty close. We could win the West just mathematically because we were the last team to get a win or something like that where we're, you know, one point up on everybody. But I don't think, you know, we can say, oh, yeah, Calgary's going to get into that catbird seat and stay there. I think, like you said, they'll they'll be one. They'll drop to two. They'll go back up to one. They'll drop to three. I think it's just going to be kind of the last team to get a win and get the last two points will be the winner. Yeah, and I don't really see there being... Like, you look at the Western Conference, and there's not a lot of very complete teams. And, it, like, even Colorado's more of a one-line team with a good goalie. And, I'm surprised Colorado's doing as well as they are. Yeah, and that's just because that one line is, frankly, awesome. And, like, what a revelation Rantanen's been for them. Uh, you know, I think he was drafted 8th or ninth overall. Like, you would expect somebody with that level of talent to be, like, the number one overall pick, but... Yeah, you know, good on them, and but I don't see them being a true threat to like be a cup finalist either, just because of the fact that they're a one line team. Yeah, no, I can agree with that. I think they could be, I think they could rack up a bunch of uh, regular season points, and definitely be in that conversation for the West, and then not do very well in the playoffs. Yeah, because y- you look at last year, the teams that were in the conference finals, Winnipeg was a very complete team. Vegas, you know, despite being new, were a fairly complete team. Uh, Tampa, best in the East, and a very complete team, but not entirely good defensively. And then the Capitals, who obviously won the Stanley Cup. So you look at, like, the teams that tend to lose, like, they have, like, a really amazing one line. Like, say, when McDavid got to the playoffs that year, that line was awesome, and that's all they had. And you look at other teams, like, say, the Dallas Stars, like, they get to the playoffs because Ben and Sagan are awesome, but the rest of their team is mediocre to bad. And that tends to be what filters out because you're getting to the point where, okay, everybody has an awesome first line, but what about line two, three, four? And that seems to be what makes the difference. And We're talking two different things, though. I think we're talking playoffs versus regular season. True. Right? I mean, the question was, can they win the West? And I think, yeah, definitely Calgary's positioned well for the playoffs, but I still think that they there's going to be some struggles there for Calgary to win the West. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. Uh, you know, it's just with the lack of high-end competition for most of the rest of the season they have a better shot than nashville who's kind of had a little bit of a more balanced schedule between good and bad and while mathematically it's definitely possible i don't see them as the president's trophy winner either yeah there's i think teams in the east that are i think that's going to go to the eastern conference this year yeah tampa's a, a bit of a scary team but they are you know there's a lot even, of mediocre. Even Toronto, I I don't want to. I wouldn't want to face Toronto early in the playoffs. No. I frankly think that they're going to lose in round one, and then like everybody's going to be like fire Babcock for the entire off season. But fire Babcock, hire Hitchcock. Yeah. Um, I I don't know. I we we can talk Toronto later. Our Flames fans probably don't want to hear that, but I think they've got three years just looking at their cap structure. Yeah. So if they can't get it done this year. Really, the the clock is ticking on that team. Yeah, well, they just don't have the defense. So, and Anderson's iffy at times. So that's, well, that's what I mean. They've got they got holes, but they don't have the money to go fill those holes. They've got most of their cap tied up in Tavares and Nylander. So they really got to do this now because they're not going to be able to go out and make a lot of changes in the off season. No, and you look at like a team like Boston, they should be able to contain those guys well enough to beat them so yeah it, i don't see toronto getting past the first round 
which that would kind of make a little bit of, you know, problems. If for Toronto the makes it past the first round, I think they're either going to be out early or they're going to go all the way. And I can see a scenario where it's Calgary Toronto in the cup finals. Yeah, so do I. I I actually wouldn't be shocked if the Flames did make the finals just due to the fact that if they get through the first two rounds, the as, the central team is going to be beat the ever loving crap up. No, for sure. I, I I don't I don't disagree with you that once the Flames are in, it's an easy road. Yeah. Um. But it's just we we're talking about the re- the regular season. I don't think they're going to win the West in the regular season. I think they can win the West in the playoffs, but I don't think they'll win the West in the regular season. Yeah. I think, yeah, this team, if, if things go the way they're going now, this team could be playing in the Western Conference Finals. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, when we put out a call for questions, we got Jared, whose uh, Twitter profile says he's the Oilers beat writer. He's at Jared2340913, who didn't give us a question but made a comment. He said, Ryan is not productive, small and loses battles. Gave puck away on Oilers goal. So I guess he wants us to comment on uh, Derek Ryan. To me, if I look at Derek Ryan as a replacement for Stajan, I'd take Ryan over Stajan right now. I, he's not. I mean, they're saying he's not productive and he loses battles. He's. We we had all our lines shuffled in that game. We the Flames weren't looking good as it was. I don't think you can judge Ryan based on just that game. But this isn't a guy who's been brought in to, you know, score a lot of goals. He's a defensive uh, centerman, and I think he's doing. Stajan's job better than Stajan did. He's a guy that he was brought in to win faceoffs and not cause problems. And he, he's been a little off the last couple games. He's been a, he's made a few mistakes, but that's pretty much been it the entire season. Just a few mistakes here and there. He's very good defensively. He's okay offensively. He's it's not going to blow you away. He's an NHL caliber forward offensively. He's a bottom six caliber forward. Yeah. And, and I think you're the last not, game, you're not they really... were looking for him to step up a little bit into the backland role, that, you know, top shutdown center, which I don't think he can do. No. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and, like, I think if you were expecting him to be, like, the 40-point guy when it, like he was in Carolina last year, I think that was largely due to the fact that Carolina's forwards suck, frankly, and, like, they have no depth or high-end talent, so somebody has to get the points, and Ryan did. Uh, Calgary has a lot more offensive depth, so you're not relying on him to be the guy, and he's doing okay. But, like, I, I don't have any problem with what he's delivered offensively. He, he's not doing anything bad defensively, by and large, he makes the odd mistake, like the McDavid goal, but he's okay. Like, there's not... We gotta quantify, it's McDavid, too. There's a lot of guys that can't contain McDavid. Yeah, like, you know, every player in the NHL, basically. So, you know. After playing 30 games, uh, Ryan has nine points this year, four goals, five assists for nine points, which puts him roughly on a trajectory of about 35 points. I think even if we can get 25 out of this guy in his role, I'm very happy with him. Yeah, like anywhere between 22 and 30, awesome. You know, like I don't... Like if he gets double digits in goals and say the same in assists, I'm fine with that. Like, you know, he's not... It, you're not expecting him to be the guy. He's basically brought in to be the face-off guy who you throw out there in the last minute where you need to win the draw to try and get the tying goal or to kill off the when you have a one-goal lead or if you're on a penalty kill or whatever. Like He's just there mainly to be the face-off guy. And he can chip in, but that's his primary goal. And he is doing a fantastic job at that so can't really complain like and he's getting basically an average salary 3.125 is about average and he's about an average player like there it it you're not getting blown like you away. said he, he made a mistake they all make mistakes i mean if we look at you know this is an oilers beat writer wrote to us you look at his size you look at his numbers he's no i mean not much better than ryan spooner numbers and size and all that wise and they both got their roles in the team, right? Spooner's not being looked at as a top offensive guy either. No. 
It's not like I think you're for, expecting Ryan to come in and be a 50-point guy. Then, you're, of course, you're going to be disappointed. But, you know, anybody sane would not have those expectations. And for the role he's in, I think he's doing... I think he's a little overpaid, but for the role he's in, I think he's doing a great job. I don't even think that. So, like, he's just okay. Like, I, you know, I don't really have any complaints at all. Well, let's move on from him then. Uh, we won't talk too much about Stockton, but I'm hearing from some people uh, this week that John Gillies played a couple games this weekend, looked better than he has in a while, and that Parsons could be returning within the next week. So it's good to get both those guys back on the ice and looking good. Uh, we know that they both had some injury troubles. Nick Schneider's been holding the fourth there. I'd be really curious to see what happens with Schneider when he goes back to the ECHL. I mean, if you can dominate in the A... You should be able to dominate the ECHL. And I have a little bit of an odd thought. What if you left him there and you sent Parsons down to the E? Let him yeah. start in the E. Because you have to reward guys if they're doing well at a level. And Snyder's done an impeccable job with Stockton. And, you know, like, we've said that about Valimaki and Shillington, like... Shillington's played well since he's been up here. Why not send the guy who's hurt down for a bit? And Yeah, you, know. you could definitely do that. I, I'm wondering if it'd be better. I mean, if we look at uh, Parsons' numbers last year, he played 28 games in the E, had a 3.16 GAA and only 90, 0.902 save percent, so saved about 90% of his shots. This year in the AHL, he played three games. He had almost five goals against and 83%. So... Yeah, maybe he has to go to the E again to find his game and then bring him up. Yeah, and plus you're encouraging guys, like, if they're playing well, hey, you get a promotion. And it's sort of like Quine. You know, he's played well in Stockton. He gets a shot. And it's also an incentive for people to sign here and all that BS like we talked about last week. Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I'm just, I think no matter where you put him, I'm glad to see the Parsons is back on the ice. We've had injury trouble with our goalie prospects between Gillies a couple of years ago and Gillies again this year. And Stockton, uh, sorry, Parsons this year, Stockton has been kind of depleted. So I'm just glad to see those guys getting back on the ice. Yeah, and hopefully they can rebound and have a good second part of their season. I don't know how conditioning assignments, if the AHL can send guys in conditioning assignments, but I wouldn't even be opposed to keeping um, Schneider in Stockton with Parsons and send Gillies down for a couple games to build his confidence. Yeah, that's possible too. I don't know if you can do conditioning assignments in the AHL or not. Um, I don't know. Well, Matt, it's that time of the show again where we look ahead to the next week, considering we've talked about all the Flames news this week, which it was if you look back, it was quite a memorable week for the Flames with the, the 9-6 win with the Minnesota game. Um, it, it was a good week. Yeah. And the Flames play a few less games. They get a bit of a break here. They get four four days break this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday, but some weird game times this coming week. So... Wednesday, the Calgary Flames are at home against the Philadelphia Flyers. Note that's a 6.30 p.m. start time, so we're not used to there. Um, Saturday, they play at Minnesota, 11.30 a.m. That's one that I might actually get myself out of bed for because of the animosity that we're going to see. And then Sunday, they're at St. Louis for a 1 p.m. start time. So some weird times this week. Um, three games, what do you think we're going to do? Well... I'm going to be bold and say six points. You think they win all three? Yeah. I. All three of these teams are on the mediocre side, and the only game that I'm really questioning is the Minnesota game. And St. Louis has been beyond terrible, and Philadelphia has been beyond terrible. So, it, like, their goaltending has just been abysmal. So in each case, so I'm not really expecting them to do much of anything, and Calgary should the, score a lot. The Philly game will be their first meeting of the year between the two teams. Last time we met St. Louis, it was a 5-3 victory for St. Louis in the first week of the season. Yeah, that was uh, Mike Smith having a bad game. I'm going to go similar to you, but I worry if it wasn't for what happened on the 6th against Minnesota, I think we'd win this one. But I can see the Flames 
Spending more time trying to get revenge, not enough time playing hockey. Yeah, that that's what I'm concerned about. But they should win that one. But I it reminds me of what we've seen in the Anaheim playoff series the last couple of years, where Calgary tries to go and be physical and stops playing hockey. Yeah. Um. So I'm gonna say that the Flames beat Philly and beat St. Louis, but I think they're gonna lose to Minnesota. And I could see that easily happening. That's the one game that could go either way. So if, if you're wanting to go to the Dome for this Philly game or there's a whole ton of games coming up um, in December at the Dome, we've got Tampa Bay, St. Louis is here again, Vancouver, San Jose, and the Flames spend about half the month of January at the Dome. Whether yourself getting a Christmas gift for a Flames fan in your life, uh, check out uh, seatgiant.ca. They've got some really good ticket prices. We talked about this last week. Some tickets below market value, below the face value of those tickets. So... I was on there today looking for a game I think our fans might want to go to, which is the New Year's Eve game on the 31st. There's still stuff in the second level that's like 60 bucks, which is a great deal to go to that game. Um, want to go to a game in January? The Flames play Colorado, Florida, Buffalo, Detroit, Arizona, and Carolina at home. So get games, get some seats for yourself to some of those games. Get seats for your friends and family. But when you go to Seat Giant, enter the promo code FIRESIDE. They know that we sent you. Can you believe New Year's Eve you can get there for 60 bucks? That's ridiculous, especially with the fact that the Flames are doing so well. You'd kind of expect that the t- um, all the tickets would be sold out by now, just because... They haven't sold out yet this year. I know, it's bizarre. Now, I'm wondering if some of it has to do with... I mean, we, we won't get into it here, but the fact that uh, I think some teams after last year, or some corporations especially, may have dropped their season tickets. Yeah, that could very well be. I think even some season ticket holders. I mean, if you go on CP, every time they lose, there's guys saying, oh, I'm going to drop my season tickets. But I'd be curious to see how many guys actually did. Yeah. But, you know, it's good for Flame fans. It means the tickets are cheaper to get in the door. So check out uh, Seat Giant and get some tickets for some of these games. It's always fun to go to the Dome. And they've changed the presentation if you haven't been yet. Different presentation this year. It's It's a different feel going to a Flames game. Well, Matt, I think that about wraps it up. We'll talk to you after these three games, and uh, I think the one to watch this week is definitely Minnesota. We'll see how that one goes on Saturday. Yeah, and frankly, they should beat Philly and St. Louis because their goaltending is just so bad. I think you said it right earlier, though. We may see a very different lineup for Minnesota. You might, you know, call a Peluso, bring Lomberg back. I don't know. Can we ice McGratton? Like, just put a bunch of heavy guys out there to get revenge. Instead of instead of a hockey stick, bring a tire iron. <laughs> well, you know, there, there's an old saying that I went to the fights and a hockey game broke out, and I think that's what we might see in Minnesota. Yeah. And knowing that, if there'll I, be no penalties and no physical altercations whatsoever. If I was them, I'd probably let Dumba stay home. Yeah. Because I think he's going to be a marked man. Well, I think refs might be looking for that and trying to nip it in the bud, so the Flames might take some penalties early if they do target him. Yeah, but I think there's certain guys that can target him. The great, they get thrown out, oh well. Like, you know, you get Lomberg thrown out again, we're not going to miss him that much. Yeah. We don't need him against St. Louis. He gets set out against Dallas. So, I don't know, you get Peluso suspended, what do we care? Like, I think there's certain guys the Flames could send out there. And Peter seems like the kind of guy who might do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and he definitely does not seem like one who will back down from anything. So I could see that. Well, he just he seems more like a Daryl Sutter type coach where he realizes, you know, hockey's a chippy game and sometimes we just have to play that type of game. Yeah, and he has managed the team very well to start the year. He was everything that I'd hope he had been. Yeah, no, he's he's an interesting guy, especially talking to him in the post-game scrums. He reminds me a lot more of Sutter and a lot less of Gullitson. Well, the him not reminding you of Gullitson at all is probably a good thing. Yeah, I, well, I mean, Gullitson was very much kind of the gentlemanly coach. He always had great hair. He always said the right things. I mean, Peters were getting some emotion out of him, especially after that Minnesota game. That's always good to hear. So, old school hockey guy. Well, Matt, we'll talk to you next week. And you have a good week and enjoy these three weird timed games. Yeah, afternoon games. Yay. Go Flames, well, go. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know why it's 6.30 game either. That's a weird yeah. start. Well, I think that's a TSN thing. Or uh, 
they have the Wednesday night hockey as well. Okay. So it might be weirdly timed because of that. I'm going to be up in the press box. I'm going to set a timer on my phone to look down at 7 and see how many people are just wandering in. Probably quite a few. I bet. Yeah, the first period will probably be empty for the first half. Yeah. All right, talk to you next week, buddy. Yeah. Go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.